Good morning, everybody. Thank you, God. Thank you, Ross. Thanks for having us. Um, it's a tough act to follow, but um, we, we're going to do our best. Uh, we're a little bit low on the credential side. I don't know if anybody else feels like it uh, in, in the room. Um, we are qualified parents, I can say that much. Um, I am a, I've got a fine arts diploma as far as that goes. Um, so I know about a, a bit about postmodernism and, and that sort of line of thinking and truth and truth being um, relative. Um, but more than that, I've got a digital agency, so we are involved in the digital space. Zoe is a strat director at Ogilvy Cape Town, so she also knows about digital strategy and where the world is going in terms of that and research they have done about where our youth is um, in terms of digital. So, and what we'd like to share with you today, we share humbly because of our own journey in my struggle with pornography that God has set me free and restored and it's been, a, it's been a rough ride. So we came through, um, uh, we at, at the time, st you know, went to our local church and said, hey guys, we've got a problem with this. Um, and we were involved with the youth, involved with the band, you know the story. Um, came forward and said, hey guys, we've got, a, we've got an issue here. We've been struggling with pornography for the longest time. We got anointed with oil, got prayed for, got sent on our way, because that's what we do, right? Um, and it didn't help. Um, and we were looking for a silver bullet, so we went for deliverance and we went for in healing prayer. And none of this was a silver bullet that helped us, because we didn't stand, uh, we didn't understand the nature of pornography. We didn't understand the nature of addiction. Um, and when you put the two together, and when we understand that we are body, soul, and spirit, and you start working with all the different aspects of that, only then can you come to to true healing. And through all the people that we met and through all the counselors and all the psychological counselors that worked with us and helped us on our way, we put together something that we call our, like our version of the 12-week recovery program uh, based on the, the, the tools that we learned along the way because we are those, those practical people that go, what is the practical thing that I can put in place? You know, like, don't give me all the Christianese. What is the practical step one, two, three, four, five that I need to do? And as such, we worked with um, psychological Christian counselors. We put together a, a recovery program. We've had several groups of people coming through recovery. Um, and um, as such, we have found that our groups have also become younger and younger. So our last group included an average age of 12. Um, that we had little boys coming through our groups exposed at the age of six and seven um, goes together with a whole systemic collapse of parents divorcing and the enemy knows exactly where to come in and strike with his, um, with his evil. So on the basis, on the back of that, our experience, our own experience and what we've seen in the groups, um, we've put together this little chat this morning. Um, and yes, it is um, a bit casual, but we want to we wanna keep it structured in some way and say we've got f four sort of pointers that we want to give to you as parents this morning. And we want to say, first of all, be in the know. So know what you're dealing with, know where your kids are, know what they're exposed to, et cetera. Um, and Zoe's gonna talk to us about that. Then secondly, just wanna reiterate um, what has been said before and in, in, in knowing your position. So knowing what you believe at your heart and at your core. And then third, have a game plan. It's not parenting by default, it's parenting by design. We need to know what, what are we going to do with our children. Um, and then a relationship, building relationships. So th along those four points, we want to structure this morning's discussion. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Zoe now. Sure. Okay. Um, I think the first thing I want to say is that, you know, when you, when you have a baby or when you're still pregnant, these those antenatal glasses, um, they tell you exactly how to change a nappy, how to bath a baby, how to... You know, there are so many practical things they tell you to do. And then parenting starts. And then I'm like, when my daughter became a preteen and a teenager, I was like, we are those people with the 10 steps. <laughs> It's like nobody gives you the practical tools. Nobody prepares you for what it is that you're going to face as a parent. So we, being a strategist, 
We put plans together and then we pivot. We pivot, I think, on a quarterly basis where we go, okay, this is not working. <laughs> We're going to have to go back to the drawing board. And I think it's in that spirit that we come to you today is that we don't have a 10-step plan for you. <laughs> we don't have rules that you have to follow and not follow. We have some principles that we've seen. And all I can say is parenting is the hardest assignment you will get. And it's not going away. <laughs> it is not going away. Signing up for a lifetime of learning, pivoting, strategizing, changing, thinking, learning, go back to go to people, ask for help. That is what parenting is. But the only thing I keep on telling us to, we're not going to stop. We're not going to give in. We're going we're gonna to continue. We're gonna, we might make, make mistakes, but hey, God, we are a testimony, the best testimony of restoration and God's power in restoring people. So what I did with my daughter is I left my need and my expectation for perfection at the door. She's going to make mistakes. She's going to make wrong choices. But God, and that's all I can say is, but God. <laughs> so the first thing I want to do is um, we want to talk about, uh, and this is research that, that come from the UCT Unilever Institute. So in marketing, what we try to do is we try to disciple your children to buy stuff that they don't need. And we try to disciple you guys to buy things that you don't need or to buy a certain toothpaste over another toothpaste. So a lot of research, a lot of money goes into understanding the mindsets, where people are, what are their current behaviors, their patterns, so we can influence it. So that's the evil part of marketing. Um, but what's great about it for me is that it gives me access to the temperature in the room. Because we look at our world through what we see in our house, what, you know, through our little lens, through our church community. But there is a South African society, and I'm going to share with you just some of the research where the youth's at at the moment. This is the sort of generic temperature in the room. Um, the youth are more exposed than any other generation. And they expose themselves more than any other generation. 93% of them have a social media account. And it's getting younger and younger. Um, one of the respondents in the study said, I was just casually checking my Snapchat, and I realized half of my friend groups were, were to together without me. But we were talk well, but talking to me on Snapchat. That's the reality that your child is facing. They are sometimes excluded from being in the room, but included digitally. And um, these age restrictions on social media that we all ignore. YouTube has got an age restriction of 18 for a reason. Every single teenager I know has got free access to YouTube. Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, it is filled with untoward content. Our children have access to it. The time they spend, 53% spend more than two hours a day on social media. Um, and I can tell you now, it's worse than two hours. <laughs> That's just the average. Um, when they're most active in the evenings, and that is family time. That's the time when we are supposed to connect. That's when the youth's on social media. There's a, a portion of them that's on social media between two and four in the morning. <laughs> um, they will say to you, I'm addictive, I know, but it's indispensable. I cannot live without this. It's part of me. No phone means no life. We are totally addicted. Imagine waiting for a bus for over 30 minutes with no device. 
Have you tried to sit in the doctor's room without your phone? And that's us, adults, who's already got a prefrontal cortex. <laughs> and just like other brands, people are expected to be best. This is what the youth feeds back. They go, I have to be the fastest. I have to be the smartest. I sometimes have to be the blackest. I have to be the funniest. That is the pressure that these guys are feeling socially. Unless you're extreme, you're nothing. And just the previous speaker you know, spoke about that social currency that you get from making certain choices. You need to stand out by doing stuff peers are not doing. There's this race to be different, to be seen, to be accepted, to be celebrated. 41% say social media leaves them frustrated or sad most of the time. Um, so they, they acknowledge that this addiction that's indispensable is leaving them in a, a sad space. And some base their self-esteem on likes and they lose touch with reality. So this is verbatim what the youth fed back in the study. This is what it's coming out of their mouths. It's even a stress not being on. I'm wondering how people are reacting to my posts. So I have this constant anxiety of what's the feedback. What I want um, to ask if you could, this is a, a, a experiment um, or activation that was done by Dove. Um, what they've done is they've, um, they've used deep fake technology and you'll see, so, so, so what they've done is they've taken some of the conversations that your child is part of and they've use this technology to put the mom in that situation telling the child those things. So it was just a way to say that as a mom, you would never say that to your child. That would never be the message you give your child, yet that is the conversation your child's part of. So it's just, it's heart-wrenching. And I don't even think they touch on the worst of it because it had to be PC. So um, I'll, I just want to play you this video so you could, could get a sense. Thank you. of her building her confidence, it can build her confidence. Marjorie is just trying to find herself now, you know, she's not influenced by social media yet. Most of the influencers that I've seen have definitely had a positive impact on me. Hey guys, here's a beauty hack I'm obsessed with. I am so happy. Look at how cinched my waist is. Look at how flat my stomach is. It's the shortcut to flawless skin. You know that Botox doesn't just reduce wrinkles, right? Baby Botox is amazing. You're never too young to start. That is not me. There are these great powders. They stop you feeling hungry so you can always skip breakfast and lunch. And you have to treat yourself to a chemical peel. They're a total glow up. They burn away the top layers of your skin and let new skin grow through. Hey, Amojo. <gasps> if your teeth are uneven, you can always file them down with a nail file. It's literally so simple. File your teeth. Don't put up with your no. thin lips, sweetie. Lip filler kits let you inject yourself at home. Thanks. They're my total go-to. Fake eyelashes are so easy to glue on. If you cut your eyelashes There's off... There's some really great pills you can use. Keep telling yourself you're not hungry. You're just thirsty. Never look bloated again. Look it into your skin. Sexy as Botox. Remember, skinny is never finished.
<laughs> it's, it's... Have you actually seen stuff like that? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> this stuff is on every girl's feed. They're watching, right? I mean, at night <laughs> when I can't see them. It's scary to me that my kids are watching this and they think that's how they have to look. I saw one of the two smiling videos. I remember that one. I remember seeing that all over. I know this stuff. I can't prevent them from seeing these, but I can talk to them about it. 100% always be talking and have Peyton know that she can always ask me anything. My mom has taught me not to listen to people like that and to be proud of who I am. called influences because they're discipling our children and our children watch them for more than two hours a day you must also just click there The other thing that they, they are doing, and that's coming back to the identity, is that they are curating an image. Um, you can be whoever you want to be on any platform at the same time. That is the truth that they're buying. Um, you are what you wear, what you listen to, what you watch, what you walk in. You are where you hang out, where you go to church, where you holiday, where you school. And none of that is our real identity, but that is to the youth of today, that is how they are curating identity for themselves. And then it's, I portray a different image of myself online. 37% of them said that. There is a huge blurring between what is true and what's a lie? There's a huge blurring between who I am, the true me, versus who I think I need to be to make it in the world. Um, and it's all about inclusivity. It's about gender inclusivity, race inclusivity, class inclusivity, mindset inclusivity. It's all about they bombard it with this. This is the narrative that they have. Um, and more woke, they're more woke than their parents or their guardians. Only 6% felt their parents were more aware of contemporary social issues. And I think we see that, is that we, we had um, a court, we, one quarter we spent with grade, third, um, grade sevens, 13 year olds, um, every Monday morning. And the first session we had with them is we, it was all about, we tried to land with them what is true, what is truth, and how do you judge what, what, what is, what's the truth. And um, the first thing we did is we asked them, what are the voices in, that you currently have in your life? So if you, if you draw a pie chart of yourself in the middle, you have all these influences. So what are the voices that you're currently bombarded with, and how do you you know, how do you determine what is true? And 13-year-olds. <laughs> so some of the voices were, my body, my choice. Um, men are trash. <laughs> that's, that's what 13-year-olds are, are feeding back to us. Um, all the social media hashtags that we see and we brush over, and some of us as parents aren't even aware of those conversations, were what those kids were feeding back to us. Um, the one was, get me a sandwich. So that's, you know, that is the, the gender sort of pushback that's happening at the moment. Um, toxic masculinity. These are words that 13-year-olds are feeding back to us. Um, that I can wear whatever I like. And... Um, 
men should just behave. That's what 13-year-olds are saying. That's their truth. 70% of the youth say that they escape to sometimes to unhealthy things to cope. And that's why I'm going to hand over to Carl, because I think what we've seen is just the biggest escape for these, these kids. It's easy nowadays to escape, and they don't have to sit and be confronted with the truth. They can go to a social media feed. They, and also, your social media feed gets curated to the things that you've shown an interest in. So their worldview becomes really narrow. There's no other influence you know, in terms of their feed because I showed that I'm interested in um, transgender topics. My entire feed will be bombarded with pro-transgender topics. So their worldview becomes really, really small. Um, and one of the things that, one of the biggest influences is in the area of hypersexuality, pornography, and we've just seen that. So Carl's going to talk to you about probably the ugliest escape that our kids go to. Marvelous, thank you. So just quickly, I'm going to try and run through this as, um, as quickly as we possibly can. For those of you who already know it, understanding pornography addiction, right? What we've got is, um, first of all, we need to understand the difference between your child being addicted and just between inappropriate behavior. So addiction is a state of being bound to a habit or practice um, or to do something that is physiologically or physically habit-forming to such an extent that it causes trauma when you try to stop. It can also be any behavior or activity that is repeatedly engaged in and so used to avoid having to deal with the reality of life. So we, of, we often talk about addicts self-medicating, whether it's alcohol, drugs, or pornography. People self-medicate because they are trying to deal with other issues in their lives. Inappropriate behavior, what, what is the difference? The difference is the frequency that they engage with it, the duration that they are on it or off it or how long the program has, um, how long the problem has persisted or the intensity um, at which they engage in it um, and the amount of risk that they will go to um, to get hold of their fix. So this was a top online aggregator site who published their stats of how many visitors they get annually. So what picture I'm trying to paint for you, how prevalent is pornography on the internet. Um, there were 81 million daily average visits to this one site um, that published their stats, and this was published in 2017. Uh, they haven't published it since, not to my knowledge. We've searched, but these stats seem to be hard to come by. Um, they have over 4 million videos uploaded in 2017. If you watched every video from start to finish, it would take you 68 years to watch the they uploaded in one year. So that's the volume of content that is available on these aggregator sites. Um, how, how pornography sites have grown since 1998, so there were 14 million, and we're now in 2022, roughly 4.5 billion porno uh, pornographic sites out there, All right? Um, um, just in terms of 42% of the users on the internet view pornography, 35% of the websites on the internet is pornographic, and every 30 minutes, this is also, I don't know how relevant this is anymore, if it's, if it's become more frequent, but every 30 min minutes a porn film is made, and every second there's 30,000 people watching pornography, which I'm sure is double, triple by now. Okay, there's a problem in the world with pornography, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. Um, is it a problem in South Africa? Do we have a problem with it? And the answer is, unfortunately, yes. South Africa, um, in, in the statistics that were published, South Africa was the top mobile device consumer of pornography in the world. Two things we can do well, we can play rugby, and we can watch porn on mobile devices. That's where we, we beat out the rest of the world. In terms of time spent per viewing, South Africa came in second in the world, um, and we're the 19th biggest mm. consumer in 2017. So I don't know in terms of our GDP where we stack, because I'm also not an economist, but I know we're not, we're not even 19th in the world or close to that. But pornography, we reign supreme. Average age of exposure, uh, we've seen in our groups, the problematic ones are seven, they're about seven years. Average age of exposure, 11 years. 
116,000 daily searches for child pornography. So if somebody is creating a demand for child pornography, searching for it, um, somebody needs to supply that demand somebody else, somewhere else in the world. So if, if, if there's a supply and demand. 90% of kids, and we, we can share um, the resources where we got these stats from, if anybody's interested, 90% of kids that were served, or um, of homes that were surveyed by kids um, up to the age of 18, or by the time they are 18, 90% of them will have had access, um, will have viewed pornography. Some by, by default or by choice or not by choice. And then 41% have made contact with dangerous or undesirable strangers, and 31% of them have sent or received messages with sexual content. So sexting is a real thing. Um, it's the way that our children engage now. And our parents, unfortunately, are in denial. 86% of these parents that were surveyed said their children never had a, my, not my child. <laughs> um, and, and that my child, would had, have, he has not seen anything bothersome online, or I don't think it was likely. And then 49% had, uh, had never had a conversation about internet safety or uh, po you know, anything pornographic. What will your children learn from? Uh, Sorry, are you? <laughs> no, you've gone too far. Yeah. I had one thing to do. <laughs> the, the presentation must be engaging. Yeah, well, she was. Fo <laughs> so he's focused. Okay, what will your children learn from pornography? So, sorry. Oh, there we, you can see on the back there, Zoe. So, what will your children learn from pornography? The f so, what these aggregators do is they aggregate the most popular things. So, even in Google. Uh, the, they'll give you the most popular information. It might not be the most peer-reviewed or most correct information, but e they'll even go for, you know, they'll even, so it's aggregated by popularity. And the 50 most popular films, 88% of them contain physical violence and 49% contain verbal aggression. Um, there's an average of 12 physical or verbal attacks per film and, and one, uh, one of them, uh, one particular disturbing scene managed to fit in 128 of these f physical or verbal attacks, um, you know, between the partners. So, what are our children learning? 95% of the victims are either neutral to the abuse or appear to respond with pleasure. So, our boys are learning that sex needs to be violent, and our girls are, are learning that they should, it's okay, I should consent with that. Um, what we are also finding is, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So then, this was a quote by the US Department of Justice back in 2004, uh, but it's, and, and you can even, they even saw, red flagged it at that point saying, never before in the history of telecommunications media has so much indecent and obscene material been so easily accessible to so many minors in so many homes with so few restrictions. So. Um, we advocate for a parenting, like a block on your Wi-Fi or a, uh, something on your app that you can actually monitor. You have to be in the conversation. You have to know what your child is viewing. Even if they slip up, it's an opportunity to have a discussion with your child and say, hey, wh why are you searching this stuff? Let's have a discussion about it. It's not a, uh, it's not a policing tool. It's a protection tool. We definitely advocate for that. If you've ever wondered, um, or if, you've, if there was any argument for pornography being addictive or doing damage to your physiology, um, this is an absolute, yeah, I mean, this ca uh, closes the case for me. So on, on your left, um, the yellow brain, that's healthy brain function that they've mapped and monitored um, and tracked, right? The brain in the middle is a brain that's, that's addicted to pornography. You can see, especially around the middle of the brain, where the pleasure center is, it's completely worn out. Um, and there's, uh, what did I say? I said, okay, sorry, it's heroin. My helper is helping me. Thank you, Zay. And then um, the brain on the right is um, even worse, effect, uh, worse affected, but especially if you look at the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex has been worn away. And that's where the moral decision-making 
that's where um, that aspect of it sits. So, um, and you can see now why uh, somebody would escalate, but I'll get to that, um, and not have the moral understanding of what they are doing. If somebody, you know, has has been desensitized and escalates into molesting a child, you'd go, but what, what were you thinking? No, they weren't thinking. The moral decision-making was cancelled out by exposure to pornography. Okay. Why is it so addictive? Because your brain is a reward center. It works, lots of chemicals involved, dopamine, endorphins, uh, but pornography both excites you and it also rewards you when, when, when you have gone through it. So now let's look at also just your device that you're on, your phone, is made with addiction in mind. The platforms that we watch these things on that's made with addiction in mind. The content, highly addictive. The act of, you know, a, a sexual act tied to that of masturbation is um, with, you know, the reward at the end of that. Put all of that together in a sandwich. It is highly addictive in the way that it stacks up and um, enforces that behavior. Uh, why is it so addictive? Lots of chemicals involved in the brain, not the neuroscient uh, uh, scientist here, but and then it rewires your brain because of um, you know this. It, it creates this new pathway where the brain says, "Well, this must be really important because I'm getting all my reward from this." Um, our brains have been um, God designed it in such a way that we would do something and be positively enforced by the chemicals that we received. After doing, you, you receive this chemical release to say, good job, well done. So now if I'm getting that kick from pornography and from, from elsewhere, um, your brain is saying to you, good job, well done. So we are hijacking the brain, um, hijacking the pleasure center of the brain, hijacking the function of the brain, and your brain goes, oh, this must be very important. Math, not so much. So especially in our young children, who have a immature prefrontal cortex, um, this is gonna affect them even more so because they can't discern between right and wrong. That's why they have parents, okay? They also have more mirror neurons which make what they see more real. That's why your child cries when Lassie dies, but you're okay because you know it's an, a dog and they've taught the dog to lie down and play dead. Your child doesn't know the difference. So when they see people interacting on a screen, it is very real to them. Okay, another reason why pornography is so dangerous is because of the escalation. There is a, a, you, we get addicted to it, we escalate to more novel, to different, to more explicit stuff, because the brain is wired for novelty. God didn't want us to sit in front of the same screen all day long. He wants us to see new things, meet new people, um, be fruitful and fill the earth. That was the first commandment. Now we are looking for more novel stuff, your brain says, but I've seen this scene, the same scene that I saw last night. I'm seeing it again. Now nah, that's not good enough. Let me go and search deeper or let me go and watch more. Let me go to more different, more explicit, more vile on the other side of the law. And then it gets really serious. Um, and now we get to a phase where we are desensitized. Everything that we saw before that was shocking, that was perverted, that was wrong. It's okay. It's become acceptable. And eventually it gets to the point where we want to act out. Okay. Um, and in the end, it also stunts brain development. So there are a couple of studies around that as well. Complicates um, developmental and developmental tasks. It limits the capacity um, to regulate, to self-regulate. It continually overloads the brain circuitry and it causes damage. And it stunts the right brain and starts to show signs of atrophy. So all your creative thought in your so it sits in the right brain is affected by that. So. As a parent, how do we deal with all of this? So our, our children are exposed, they're vulnerable, you know, where do we position ourselves? And I think this is, as the first speaker said as well, you need to understand what is your position as a parent. And I think in, in the name of political correctness, um, we've allowed so many things into even into the church, into the body of Christ, because we go, well, you know what I do, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. What happens outside of my house, that's not really my concern. The problem is that the other, the other half, they are concerned what is happening in your house. And they're trying very hard um, through every, every channel at their dispos the disposal to influence your child. Whether it be Disney, that have just been exposed now with their work agenda. Whether it be the superhero movies that our kids are watching. 
every single one of those things are aimed and geared at um, changing your child's worldview so that Jesus is not the superhero anymore. There's a whole array of superheroes that we can, we can look to. Um, yeah, that wasn't part of the plan, but I think it's, it's relevant. <laughs> so, Carl's tangent. So, also then, so cultural Christianity versus followers of Jesus. Are we just, because we become cultural, there's this cultural Christianity where there's even some of these, um, the, these academics and scholars who go, you can be um, a, a non-believing Christian. So we, we grow up in this Christian society that have all these wonderful um, rules and, and, and things in place, this platform of respect for others and love and kindness and goodness. And, um, and as a result, um, when something else comes in, we go, oh, we must be good, we must be kind, we must love our neighbor. And, and we allow these things into our society um, until later when, you know, now they are trying to actively take over our society and actually push us out. So it's, it's and especially in terms of the voices in your child's head, um, the stuff that he's being bombarded with. And it's not just from a Christian point of view. I don't know if you guys have seen The Social Dilemma on Netflix. So instead of watching a movie on Netflix, go watch The Social Dilemma. Um, and then they just talk about the... The, the volume of voices that are children, you know, the half truths that the children are confronted with. It's at a rate of six to one. So for every truth, there are six untruths that they are exposed to. And how does your child make sense of that? You have to bring them back to the objective moral truth, which is the Word of God. We have to bring them back to boys are boys and girls are girls. And because the Word of God said, I created man and woman, and yes, there are every other complication, but you know, if it's as simple as that, then it makes it simple for our children to understand as well. So in knowing your position, the question, who is teaching your child? Because the Word of God says, you shall teach them um, to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Train up a child in the way that it should go, and when it is older, he will not depart from it. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you, for reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. So we must be ready to give our children. <laughs> um, so we must be ready to, to help our children also develop their point of view. And it is having the conversation from, you know, like hey, wonderful, you've, you've got a penis, hey, wonderful, you don't have, and that's the way we talk about it, and, you know, like, be, be open and be real about those things with your children, um, so that it's absolutely modeling from, from the youngest age. Okay, so our question is, are you teaching your first disciple? Because they will be your, we don't have to go out into Africa and make disciples, or out into India and go and disciple people. Jesus has given you disciples in your home, and how are you discipling them? Are they going to walk out of your house as disciples of Christ, followers of Jesus? Or will they have some sort of moral paganism of a sort of a Christian worldview, like a loosey-goosey Christian worldview? Or will they be very strong followers of Christ? And then, um, or are they being taught by social media and strangers? Right? So we want to challenge you to really go and research some of these topics and and make it out for yourself where you stand on gender identity, where you stand on my body, my choice. Where do you stand on abortion? Where do you stand on modesty? What, what women can and cannot do, what men can and cannot do, where should we be? Feminism is something that's come along, um, along with communism and Marxism, this whole work agenda that comes from the left, that we, you know, we're so respectful and we so, you know, in, because... You know, you wouldn't want to be found on the right, especially in South Africa, in terms of your political view. Or, you know, so you want to be as, as politically correct, especially in a country, country like South Africa. But in terms of a leftist worldview, this woke agenda that comes in, that wants to destroy, destroy order, destroy a godly order, destroy a godly construct of what they call the patriarchy. But it it's really is a fight of good versus evil. It's really evil coming in to destroy anything and everything that was good. Okay, that's my rant. Uh, 
And then porn culture. Understand porn culture. Understand how it's influencing the way that your the, the, the clothes that's in the store that your child is that that your daughter is trying on or that your daughter is going to want to buy. Understand how that's all been influenced by porn culture and what your view on it is. So that when you take a position, because if you are neutral, um, you're not going to win this war. Um, so Zoe's going to chat to us about the game plan. And I'll do the slide. Thank you. <laughs> Yo. I really failed in that department. I do apologize. So I think the first thing we're saying is you need to know. You need to be in the know. I think what we do very well as parents is we do the ostrich thing. And it's for many reasons. Not because we want to be bad parents. We're busy. We're busy and we, we've got math to focus on. We've got you know, these, these academic stats that's in the picture, they are the easy, probably the easier things that's in the picture. These are the hard things. These are conversations that are happening outside of us. It's hard to be part of these conversations. But if we're not in it, we are losing the battle before it's even started. So the first thing is you have to be in the know. You need to know the conversations that your child is confronted with. We need to get comfortable with talking about these things. I never thought that I would have to talk to my child about some of the things that I had to talk to her about. It was very uncomfortable at the beginning. But when I realized, oh, this is playground chat. They talk about far worse things than what, you know, and if I'm not in there, that conversation is running away from me. So this, you have to be in the know, and you have to have a point of view. What we've just seen is that us as parents have not really thought about it. We haven't had time to think about it. We're not in that transgender thing because we're not necessarily confronted with it in the workplace. We're not in the gay conversation because we don't have, maybe, we're not confronted with that, or maybe we think it's not our problem yet. Um, so we don't have a point of view. Sometimes we don't even have a point of view on abortion. We haven't made it out for ourselves. Until you confront it with it, where your child is in a Christian school, and they have a conversation about abortion, and she's the only one in a Christian school that says that it's wrong. Her and the teacher, the only one in that classroom, the rest of them being discipled. They go, it's my body, my choice, and nobody will tell me that I cannot have an abortion. So we didn't think to have an abortion conversation with our child because it didn't come up. It didn't come up. We, we didn't think to go there. All of a sudden, you need to go, what's my point of view? What's my point of view in love? How do I break this point of view to my child? How do I have these conversations on a regular basis so that it doesn't come across as, I, because I said so? You know, because that's the other default behavior we have is because I said so. The Bible says it, it must be like that. Children don't take that. They don't, they don't, they don't, you know, we, I'll give you an example. Our daughter started to have, um, she started to listen to K-pop. So the Korean culture is very much part of teenage culture at the moment. Um, so, and she, all of a sudden, she wants posters of these K-pop artists on her wall and what have you. Every single boy in the band wears makeup and is quite effeminate, you know? So generally you would go, Oh, you know, it's just a phase. It's K-pop, you know, how bad can it be? We realized we need to just have a casual conversation and go, do you, because she would say, oh, mom, this boy is so attractive. And then you go, okay, what, what do you think makes him attractive? You know, he wears makeup. That's kind of strange. You know, in my days, men didn't wear makeup. Um... And she would go, yeah, but that, that's, not, that's not to say that he's, he only wears it on stage, you know, and it's not, it's not girly makeup. Um, and, then, and then she goes, you know, that is just my taste. 
and then you can talk to her about, but what influenced your taste? Have you had boys with makeup on your feed 24-7? It's going to influence what you find attractive. That's what you've been fed. Now you, have, now you have an opportunity to talk about what's the agenda in the world around masculinity. Masculinity is being attacked at the moment. Being a real man is not favorable in the world. It's been labeled as toxic. Girls are going, men are trash. When that movement breaks, every single hashtag on my daughter's Instagram is men, men are trash. So all of a sudden, we could have a conversation about that. We could go, it went from a K-pop poster to let's talk about what's the narrative in the world at the moment and how is that influencing your perception of what a man should be. And then you go, okay, what's God saying? What's God saying about what a real man is? Let's talk about that. Let's go to the objective. Let's go to the designer <laughs> that designed men. And he had a blueprint for how, what a man should be. And then let's talk about that. And let's just get your principles right. That you don't, that, and I'm not, she's still listening to K-pop, I'm sure. Um, but we had the conversation that that's not necessarily what you should start to take as the ultimate godly man. So you need to be in the know and um, you need to have a point of view, and then you need to have a game plan. So um, we, all I'm saying is a plan doesn't have to be perfect, but at least have a plan. Have a, have a strategy of how you're gonna have these conversations with your child at what age. As parents, we need to work together. We need to go, okay, how are we gonna handle this? And we had many challenges where, um, you know, and you don't think about these things until they happen to you. So all of a sudden, there's a boyfriend on the, in the picture. Now you go, we, we know, we, we can see this boy is hypersexualized. What's your view on this and what's your game plan? Because, and we plotted the strategies. We went, okay, let's get practical. One is we can ban him from our house. <laughs> That's one, it's a strategy. And you might decide as parents, she's 16 years old or 15 years old, banning is gonna be our strategy. But you must know that banning will have consequences, that she might rebel, then you need to have a, a risk mitigating strategy for that, okay? <laughs> there might be other things that pop out the woodwork. She might start to lie she might start to, to sneak away. So we went, we went like, okay, banning option. Okay, this could potentially happen. She's in school with him. She's at youth with him. Okay, so banning is not an option. Okay, <laughs> so what's our plan B? What's our plan C? All I'm saying is have a plan. Don't think that it's just gonna go away. He's gonna be around <laughs> and it's, Then I think you need to understand your role within this. What stance are you going to take? And, and then be prepared to pivot. Like, be prepared to make, make um, you know, changes to your plan. The other thing that I would say is be very clear very early on. When your child's two, four, six, when they're little, have a plan now as to when are you going to give them their, their first phone? Go look at what the dangers are around that. In fact, go do your research and then decide when are you going to give them their first phone. Then decide up front what rules you're going to have around that and don't break your own rules. Because once you've given it with no rules, after that, after the fact, is really hard. So boundaries up front. Go away today and go figure out when you are prepared to give your child a phone. Decide how you're going to manage that and be prepared to take it away when it doesn't work. So I'll tell you what we did because we, luckily, we went through our journey before Lisa hit the age where she wanted a phone. But we knew we're not going to give her a phone 
we're going to stretch it as far as we can. So that was our strategy. Then we said, okay, we're going to give you a phone, but this comes with responsibility. So here are the rules. Responsibility and accountability. So if we see that you cannot manage your time on this phone, we will have to manage it for you. So we're going to give you a little bit of rope. If you hang yourself, game over. Then we, we say to her, um, we're going to let you make certain choices, but if those choices are dangerous, then we're going to step in. So we, she always knew that we're going to step in. Also said to her, I will always know the password to your phone, and I must be able to pick up your phone at any given time and look at it. Easier said than done, because you do feel like a terrible person to go, come, let me have a look. She wanted Instagram. She's an artist. She wanted to put all her art up on Instagram. I said to her, the only, um, the only way you can have Instagram is if I have access to your Instagram. Best decision I've ever made. I have helped my child through a very, very tough thing because I had access. I see some of the children on Instagram that's in her class, and I want to cry because... The mom and the dad's not part of that child's journey that she's going through. They've got no idea. They can't see how she is actually falling off the rails, and I can see it firsthand. So I say, be on your child's Instagram. There came a time when she was like, this is oh so hard for me, but she's accountable. There's an adult that is watching her. And I said to her, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna shout at you when you make a wrong mistake. We're gonna have a conversation. Eight, nine months in, she sat when the, when the, um, the problem was removed. She said, she said to me, Mom, now, for the, she said to me, I just wanna say thank you. I wanna thank you because I didn't know how to identify the toxicness of this relationship. I didn't see the dangers, but I learned. I learned and you were there. You were there to catch me, to cry with me, to hold me, to guide me, to pray with me. There was someone there, an adult who could help. A lot of these kids don't have an adult. They're in that conversation. They don't know what to do with it. They feel stuck and and there's no adult to help them. Um, yeah, I just wanna, if you can go back to, um, yeah, so, so I, would, I would just encourage you to decide what your boundaries are, and it's hard. We had, I'll be honest with you, we had fights about boundaries, because sometimes I would go give some rope and Carl's like, no, we can't give her, we can't, you know. I've also had times when I was like, no, I think we need to give her space. And then Carl said, okay, okay, we'll give her space. And then it goes wrong, and then I go like, oh, why didn't I listen to Carl? He had the gut feel that we shouldn't have given her the space, you know. So just work together and, and decide. And be very clear about it. Don't be wishy-washy. If it's two hours a day, stick to two hours a day. If it's you can have it with, if I have access to the password, stick to it. Just make those rules. Don't wait for it to, to run away with you. So I'm going to leave you with that. And then the last thing is what we've just seen is relationship. Relationship is everything. And this was a big learning for us. And we actually went to another talk. And we learn from every talk that we go to because there are other speakers that are, that are just so, so, so good at these talks. And, and there was a specific... Um, just talk around parenting styles, and that really helped us tremendously when we understood that sometimes we have um, the wrong, the wrong parenting, parenting approach, and um, and and it just shows you that parenting is uh, it's it's really sorry. I just want to pull this up. Parenting is really. Um, a learning curve for all of us. None of us have done it before. If you think about it, it's like we're in a job that we're not qualified for. It's not like we had a test run. 
You know, it's like you get thrown into it and you have to figure it out along the way. So there are four, more or less four parenting styles, and three of the parenting styles really create children's, children with a high propensity for addiction. Um, and that is the authoritarian, so it's that guy in the, so it's, it's very, it's, it's high control, Carl's authoritarian. Really, really well Yeah, <laughs> so it's strict, you've got high expectations, you give orders, you reject, you control, you're unsupportive. That is a, an authoritarian. You are the authority in the house, you've got high levels of control, levels of warmth and, and affection. So that child will follow you because they're scared, not because there's a relationship. And the minute that they have free reign, I promise you they're going to do the opposite of what you told them to do. Then you have uninvolved parents. Uninvolved parents, I mean, it's uninvolved, rejecting, neglecting, self-absorbed, no boundaries. And it, uninvolved parents are generally your very, very busy parents, outsourced parents. Um, it, is the, it is very prevalent in this day and age. Because to, in order to, to have the lifestyles that we, that we want, in order to stay in that house and the estate, drive that 1.5 million rand car, you're going to have to sell your soul to some corporation. You're going to be busy. So you're going to have to outsource some of the parenting, which means that you're uninvolved. Then there's permissive parenting. So there's the parenting where I'm going to be your friend. If I'm friendly with you, if I'm with you, if I'm rocking it out with you, gosh, we're going to have a good time, and you're going to love me, and you're going to do everything that I tell you to do, and you're going to be an obedient child. So you're very affectionate. You might be very nurturing. You might be a little bit indulgent, but no control. It's like, you know what? I did it when I was young. Let the kids be kids. It's just a phase. Oh, they're having such a good time. No, they're throwing back tequilas at the age of 16. It's a problem. <laughs> um, so you give in. You don't have curfews. You have, you're inconsistent. You don't have boundaries. It's pro problematic parenting, and we have to put hand on heart and say, look, am I a little bit permissive in the wrong areas, you know? Um, so I think what we tend to do is we flip-flop between permissive, then it goes wrong, then we become authoritarian. We're like, no, I'm going to put this boundary, and you will, you ground it for life, um, <laughs> which is also not helpful. So um, where we have to aim for is high warmth and high control. So that is where we say we are authoritative. Um, Boundaries, expectations, responsive, accepting, open communication, and discipline. They did a study um, where they put children in um, a field with no um, fence around it, and they all huddled in the middle. Nobody explored. There was no boundary. And then when they put the fence around it, they explored right up until the fence. So... It's so important that we put boundaries in place, that we have healthy boundaries for our children, but also don't make them so rigid <laughs> that we have to be able to, to change because we all still learning. Our child's an individual. Our child's got, got you know, a different, specific personalities. We had to figure that out, and we're still figuring it out. And with every developmental stage, it sort of changes. And then you're like, oh, now we're dealing with something different here, so we're going to have to pivot. So we want to leave you with this, is that don't remove yourself out of the conversation, be in the conversation, know what's the temperature on the ground, understand what the youth is talking about, learn to have those conversations um, in the right manner, and have a game plan, and build a relationship. Relationship is everything. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.
just as we're closing off, can I ask you to speak to us about two other things, please? Um, I, I know as a church, Ross, um, you can maybe just tell everybody as well. You've got, oh, is this the line for the video? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I didn't click. <laughs> um, so uh, as a church as well, you have a very good um, uh, pornography addiction program that you also run. Uh, Carl and Zoe here uh, also run a similar program like that. We've spoken about it before. The I, Me movement that speaks to different areas of addiction. If you could just quickly, just two minutes, give us an insight onto that. And then also, just practically, most of you will be aware of different ways of um, having programs on your phones, between phones as a family. You also have a particular one uh, that you can make available. Just tell us about Custodio as well. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so if you, uh, our web address is imemovement.co.za. So ime is all about accountability. So ime, it's a ripoff of the iPhone because it's the digital generation. I need to, to spell all of that out for you. But so imemovement.co.za, um, and we deal with digital addiction, but there's also, you know, gaming addiction is sort of a gateway drug, and all the parents will say, no, but my child's just, at least he's not hanging out in the mall and doing drugs. He is doing a drug in your, it's, it's on your sofa, um, and it's not teaching him all that he needs. So we, um, there are some resources on the page. Um, another valuable resource for parents is commonsensemedia.org, um, if you guys want to take a look at that. And the other um, organization that we work with closely is uh, case-sa.org. Um, they also have wonderful books, um, parenting books, and how do you talk to children about pornography, especially to the younger ones. You talk about good pictures, bad pictures. You don't talk about pornography. You don't use words and terms that they don't already know or understand or come to you with. So you, you address it on their level of understanding, especially for those of you with younger kids. Um, but yeah, so we've, the IME movement, um, we have talks at schools, um, we have talks such as these, and then we also have recovery groups. We have a recovery program, we've been running that with, uh, with adults now online, um, and then with younger kids in person, if it is within our vicinity and it is possible for us to all make it to the same venue. Um, and that's a 12-week, 90-day program. We also have a software called um, that we we've bought purchased a whole lot of licenses that you can buy for 700 rand a license that covers you for five devices for a whole year. So if you work it out, it's like 11 rand a month for your device. Your data will cost you more. So it's called Custodio, and it's on our website you, at on the IME Movement There's Custodio. It's designed for parents to be able to monitor what your child is seeing online, but you can also even set uh, the amount of time that they are allowed to access the internet. W you know, what time of day are they allowed to access the internet? Um, because wonderful good parents that we are, we switch off the light and say good night, and we go to bed, and our, our children sit till the wee hours of the morning on the internet, and they have access to the whole wide web, and we, we think they are innocent, and they will not find themselves in dark places, but they do. So we need to be able to that, and it's part of that conversation of saying, look, you are at an age where you are allowed two hours of screen time per day. We're gonna, your phone will be accessible for that. For that time only, you'll be able to have one hour of internet access, and you can block the sites, or they're already blocked, pornography is already blocked, but you can block specific sites if you see that, they are, that there is problematic behaviors involved in that. Um, and, you know, we go, oh, I'm going to take my child's phone away. It's going to be so, you know, what are they going to do? They go, they play for two hours on the phone. If the phone switches off, they go, oh, it's off. They put it down and they go and play outside. They do something else with their time. It is we have trained them to be addicted and to, um, you know, or we've allowed them to become addicted to the device. The boredom is a very good thing. Um, or the a child psychologist will tell you that. It's very good for us to be bored because it stimulates creative thought. We stimulate creative juices and we do things. We find new things to do with our time that is valuable. I think just um, a quick overview of our program. Um, it's 90 days because it takes about 90 days for the, the brain to be rewired. But it's, it can be a much longer walk for, for some, depending on how 
how entrenched the habits and the patterns are. Um, but we, we've, we've stuck to, to 90 days, which is really a good, good start. Um, and we start off by the, we call it the no, grow, go um, sort of format. We, you start off by just understanding what has happened to you. What, what, is, the, what is your current addictive bat patterns? What are the things that makes you run to this? When do you go to it most? To, to really get that self-awareness of what has happened to me, how addictive am I, um, what's my, my addictive cycle, etc. And then we go into um, the, the grow part is really to start to see, because pornography is not the problem, it's what's What's driving you there? So that's a, a very sort of deep part of the of the program is really to get to the heart of why do I run there? It's your negative core beliefs. And this is where we start to see a lot of the, you know, the deep-seated stuff pops out of the woodworks is that I'm actually not happy with myself. There are certain, I've got self-esteem issues, I've got identity issues, I've got daddy issues, I've got mommy issues. All those things sort of pop out the, at the woodwork. Um, and then we deal with that. And then lastly, the last session is where we future-proof. We go into future-proofing. So what are you going to do the day the 90 days are over? What's going to be your new pattern, your purpose, trying to find your purpose in life, trying to find those things that's going to keep you out of addiction, that's going to build your identity so that you don't fall back into it. So that's sort of the format of the, of the program. Um, and it's, it's been, we've had amazing testimonies. Some people had to come back three times because the journey is just their journey. Um, so we also are very patient with that because we know that, um, you know, if, if there was a silver bullet and a 90 minute, um, you know, pocket, pocket recovery group, we would have given it to you, but it's, it's unfortunately not. Thank you.